Exploring the Titanic by Robert D. Ballard, Chapter 5, Exploring the Great Ship. With a big grin, I turned and gave the thumbs up sign for a good luck to the crew standing on the deck of our new research ship, Atlantis II. In stocking feet, I began to climb down the ladder inside Alvin, our tiny submarine. It was July 13, 1986, almost a year after our French-American expedition had first found the Titanic and taken photographs of her. Unfortunately, our French colleagues were not able to join us this year. I would miss my friend, Jean-Louis. We had steamed up to where the Titanic lay in the treacherous North Atlantic. Now it was time to take a closer look at her. Our goal was to dive two and a half miles into the pitch black freezing depths to where the Titanic lay. Then we would try to land Alvin on her decks. If all went well, we would be the first human beings in 74 years to see the legendary ship at close range. We closed Alvin's hatch and I exchanged glances with my pilot and co-pilot as we felt our submarine gently rocking back and forth. We knew that meant we were now dangling half over the deck of Atlantis II and half over the water. One of the most dangerous moments of a dive. Should the sub suddenly fall in, we could all get badly hurt. But we hit the water safely and then our lift line was released. The divers swarmed on over the sub, checking everything, including Jason Jr., or JJ. JJ was our remote-controlled underwater robot who was attached to the outside of Alvin in a special garage. He operated on a long cable attached to our sub and was equipped with still and video cameras. With his help, we hoped to explore inside the rock below. The three of us were crammed into the tiny cabin, our inner space capsule. Hemmed in by panels of instruments, we had no room to stretch out or stand up. We were like three sardines in a spherical can. It was warm and stuffy, but the ice cold water outside would soon cool Alvin's hull, both outside and inside. Daylight began to fade into deeper and deeper blues as our sub reached its maximum descent speed of 100 feet per minute. It would take us two and a half hours to reach the bottom. There was little talking as we fell swiftly into utter darkness. Soft music played on the sub stereo. Suddenly, a white tipped shark appeared outside my window and disappeared just as quickly. Sharks often swim by Alvin to investigate the noise. It was comforting to know that two inches of metal protected us. I remembered the time a swordfish had attacked Alvin and got its sword stuck in the sub. The long fall to the bottom is usually a lulling experience. The interior gets darker and darker and begins to cool until less than and begins to cool until after less than 15 minutes the sub has reached a depth of 1200 feet and total darkness to conserve power alvin's outside lights are left off the only illumination inside comes from three small red lights but this time we had technical problems to worry about first we discovered that alvin's sonar had stopped working Probably either the cold seawater or the increasing pressure had damaged it. Sonar guided us by bouncing electronic sound waves off anything in our path. Without sonar, we couldn't see beyond a few yards. Our surface navigator on board Atlantis II would have to guide us to the Titanic with his sonar and our sub-to-ship telephone. A few minutes later, at about 2,000 feet, we passed through what is known as a deep scattering layer because it shows up like a cloudy blur on sonar. In fact, the cloud is made up of thousands and thousands of tiny creatures that live at this depth of the ocean. Many of them glow in the dark, their small bodies exploding like fireworks as they become aware of our presence. When I first saw these creatures, they reminded me of a tiny passenger train with lighted windows passing by at night. By the time we had passed 5,000 feet, almost one hour into our dive, it was getting cold in the sub. We put on our first layers of extra clothing. I was wearing a wool hat for my son's hockey team to keep my head warm. During the long hours in the tiny cabin, my legs often fell asleep, and sometimes I'd have a bad cramp in my hip. At times like that, Alvin's cabin was more like a torture chamber than a space capsule. 10 minutes later, at 6,000 feet, our pilot noticed that the instrument panel was showing a saltwater leak into the battery banks that power the sub. 
Our time on the bottom of the ocean would have to be awfully short today. And to make things even worse, the surface navigator's sonar suddenly stopped working. That meant we were now almost completely blind. Our lights pierced the blackness as the ocean bottom slowly emerged from the dark green gloom below us. We'd arrived. The only trouble was we didn't know where we were. All we could see through the portholes was our own shadow cast by Alvin's lights and some gently rolling ground covered with mud. So close and yet so far away. The ship lay somewhere near us, probably no more than 400 feet, the length of two city blocks. But when you're more than two miles down in black murk, a few hundred feet without any guiding sonar might as well be a thousand miles. I couldn't believe it. I had waited 13 long years for this moment, and now, a stone's throw away from the dream, I was trapped inside a sardine can on my hands and knees, staring at nothing but mud. Suddenly, a head-splitting alarm buzzer pierced the silence inside our tiny sub. The leak in our battery was getting to the critical point. We had very little time left if we were to get back to the surface without damaging Alvin. Quickly, we decided to guess where the Titanic might be and blindly go there in a last-ditch throw of the dice. Alvin now gently touched the bottom with its single runner, like a one-legged skier, and we began to inch along. The shrill alarm was starting to drive us crazy, and the tension in the sub was heavy. Our time was running out fast. It was going to be a very close call if we hoped to see the Titanic. Then, our surface navigator called in on the telephone with the good news that his sonar was working again, and that the Titanic should be about 50 yards west of us. We turned the sub and strained our eyes to see out the portholes. Now, the bottom began to look strange. It began to slope sharply upward, as though it had been bulldozed into place. My heartbeat quickened. Come right, I said to the pilot. I think I see a wall of black just on the other side of that mud mound. Then, directly in front of us, there it was, an endless slab of rusted steel rising out of the bottom, the massive hull of the Titanic. I felt like a space voyager peering at an alien city wall on some empty planet. Slowly, I let out my breath. I didn't realize I had been holding it in. But one look at the fabulous wreck was all I got. Our pilot quickly dropped Alvin's weights, clicked off that horrible alarm, and we went hurtling toward the surface. One moment longer on the bottom, and Alvin's power system would have been in extreme danger. All we had to show for six hours' work was a brief glimpse of the Titanic, but my dream had finally come true. I was in a grim mood when I stepped out of the sub onto the deck of the Atlantis II. I saw the ship for about 10 seconds, I said, but we've got a sick puppy here and we've got to fix it. If we wanted to dive the next day, we had to take care of our growing list of technical problems. While I slept, our team of experts worked through the night to cure our sick submarine. Luckily, it was all systems go the next morning, and we were full of confidence as we began a second dive. Our goal was to check out possible landing sites for Alvin on the decks of the Titanic. Our second view of the Titanic was breathtaking. As we, glide, as we glided soundlessly across the ocean bottom, the razor's edge of the bow loomed out of the darkness. The great ship towered above us, Suddenly, it seemed to be coming right at us, about to run us over. My first reaction was that we had to get out of the way, but the Titanic wasn't going anywhere. As we gently brought our sub closer, we could see the bow more clearly. Both of her huge anchors were still in place, but the bow was buried more than 60 feet in mud, far too deep for anyone to pull her out of the ooze. It looked as though the metal hull was slowly melting away. What seemed like frozen rivers of rust covered the ship's side, and spread out over the ocean bottom. It was almost as if the blood of the great ship lay in pools on the ocean floor. As Alvin rose in slow motion up the ghostly side of the ship, I could see our lights reflecting off the still unbroken glass of the Titanic's portholes. They made me think of cat's eyes gleaming in the dark. In, place, in places, the rust formations over the potholes looked like eyelashes with tears, as though the Titanic were crying. I could also see a lot of reddish-brown stalactites of rust over the wreck, like long icicles. I decided to call them rusticles. This rust turned out to be very fragile. If touched by our sub, it disappeared like a cloud of smoke. 
As we rose further and began to move across the mighty forward deck, I was amazed at the sheer size of everything. Giant bollards and shiny bronze capstans that were used for winding ropes and cables, the huge links of the anchor chains. When you were there on the spot, the ship was truly titanic. I strained to get a good look at the deck's wood planking, just four feet below us. Then my heart dropped to my stomach. It's gone, I muttered. Most of the Titanic's wooden deck had been eaten away. Millions of little wood-eating worms had done more damage than the iceberg in the salt water. I began to wonder whether the metal deck below the destroyed wood planking would support our weight when Alvin landed. We would soon find out. Slowly, we moved into position to make our first landing test on the forward deck just next to the fallen mast. As we made our approach, our hearts beat quickly. We knew there was a risk, a real risk of crashing through the deck. The sub settled down, making a muffled crunching noise. If the deck gave way, we'd be trapped in collapsing wreckage. But it held, and we settled firmly. That meant there was a good chance that the Titanic's decks would support us at other landing sites. We carefully lifted off and turned toward the stern. The dim outline of the ship's superstructure came into view. First, B deck, then A. Finally, the boat deck, the top deck where the bridge was located. It was here that the captain and his officers had guided the ship across the Atlantic. The wooden wheelhouse was gone, probably knocked away in the sinking. But the bronze telemotor control to which the ship's wheel had once been attached stood intact, polished to a shine by the current. We then safely tested this landing site. I had an eerie feeling as we glided along exploring the wreck. As I peered through my porthole, I could easily imagine people walking along the deck and looking at the windows of the ship that I was looking into. Here I was at the bottom of the ocean, looking at a kind of time capsule from history. Suddenly, as we rose up the port side of the ship, the sub shuddered and made a clanging noise. A waterfall of rust covered our portholes. We've hit something, I exclaimed. What is it? I don't know, our pilot replied. I'm backing off. Unseen overhangs are the nightmare of a deep sub pilot. Carefully, the pilot backed away from the hull and brought us slowly upward. Then, directly in front of our forward porthole, a big lifeboat davit slid by. We had hit one of the metal arms that held the lifeboats as they were lowered. This davit was one of the two that held boat number eight, the bold boat Mrs. Strauss had refused to enter that night. She was the wife of the owner of the Macy's department store in New York. When she had been offered a chance to save herself in one of the lifeboats, she had turned to her husband and said, We have been living together for many years. Where you go, I go. Calmly, the two of them had sat down on a pile of deck chairs to wait for the end. Now, as we peered out our portholes, it seemed as if the boat deck were crowded with passengers. I could almost hear the cry, Women and children first! We knew from the previous year's pictures that the stern had broken off the ship. So we continued back to the search for the severed end of the intact bow section. Just beyond the gaping hole where the second funnel had been, the deck began to plunge down at a dangerous angle. The graceful lines of the ship disappeared in a twisted mess of torn steel plating, upturned portholes, and jumbled wreckage. We saw enough to know that the decks of the ship had collapsed in, an, in on one another, like a giant accordion. With an unexpectedly strong current pushing us toward this twisted wreckage, we veered away and headed for the surface. The next day, we landed on the deck next to the very edge of the grand staircase, which had once been covered by an elegant glass dome. The dome hadn't survived the plunge, but the staircase shaft had, and to me, it still represented the fabulous luxury of the ship. Alvin now rested quietly on the top deck of the RMS Titanic, directly above the place where three elevators had carried first-class passengers who did not wish to use the splendid grand staircase. We, however, would take the stairs with JJ the robot, our R2-D2 of the deep. This would be the first deep water test for our remote-controlled swimming eyeball, and we were very nervous about it. No one knew whether JJ's motors could stand up to the enormous ocean pressure of more than 6,000 pounds per square inch. Using a control box with a joystick that operated like a video game, the operator cautiously steered JJ out of his garage, attached to the front of Alvin. Slowly, 
JJ went inching down into the yawning blackness of the grand staircase. More and more cable was let out as he dropped deeper and deeper. We could see what JJ was seeing on our video in the sub, but at first JJ could see nothing. Then, as he dropped deeper, a room appeared off the port side foyer of Adeth. JJ swung around and our co-pilot saw something in the distance. Look at that, he said softly. Look at that chandelier. Now I could see it too. No, it can't be a chandelier, I said. It couldn't possibly have survived. I couldn't believe my eyes. The ship had fallen two and a half miles, hitting the bottom with the force of a train running into a mountain. And here was an almost perfectly preserved light fixture. JJ left the stairwell and, stared to, and started to enter the room, managing to get within a foot of the fixture. To our astonishment, we saw a feathery piece of coral sprouting from it. We could even see the sockets where the light bulbs had been fitted. This is fantastic, I exulted. Bob, we're running short on time. We have to return to the surface. Our pilot's words cut like a knife through my excitement. Here we were, deep inside the Titanic, actually going down the grand staircase. We had used up all our time that we had to safely stay on the bottom. I knew our pilot was just following orders, but I still wanted to shout and protest. Our little robot soldier emerged from the black hole and shone his lights toward us bathing the interior of the sub in an unearthly glow. For a moment, it felt as if an alien spaceship were hovering nearby. But that feeling quickly gave way to one of victory, thanks to our little friend. JJ had been a complete success. On our next day's dive, we crossed over what had once been Captain Smith's cabin. Its outer wall now lay collapsed on the deck, as though a giant had brought his, first, his fist down on it. We passed within inches of one of the cabin's windows. Was this, I wondered, a window that Captain Smith had cranked open to let a little fresh air into his cabin before going to bed? Suddenly, a large piece of broken railing loomed out of the darkness. It seemed to be heading right for my viewport. I immediately warned the pilot, who quickly turned Alvin's stern around, rotating us free of the obstacle. Now we began to drop onto the starboard boat deck as we glided along. I felt as though I were visiting a ghost town where suddenly one day everyone had closed up shop and left. An empty lifeboat davit stood nearby. Ahead, I could see where the Titanic lifeboats had rested. It was on this very deck that the crowds of passengers had stood waiting to get into the boats. They had not known until the last moments that there were not enough lifeboats for everyone. It was also from this deck that you could have heard the Titanic's brave band playing cheerful music to boost the crowd's spirits as the slope of the deck grew steeper and steeper. Jason Jr. now went for a stroll along the boat deck. As he slowly made his way around, along, he looked in the windows of several first-class cabins, as well as into some of the passageways, including one that still bore the words, first-class entrance. As JJ passed by the gymnasium windows, I could see bits and pieces of equipment amid the rubble, including some metal grillwork that had been part of the electric camel an old-fashioned exercise machine. We could see various wheel shapes and a control lever. Much of the gym ceiling was covered with rust. This is where the gym instructor, dressed in white flannel trousers, had urged passengers to try the gym machines. And on the last night, passengers had gathered here for warmth as the lifeboats were being lowered. I could see JJ far off down the deck turning this way and that way to get a better view inside doorways and various windows. It was almost as though our little robot had a mind of its own. Now, we had to bring him home. We had been on the Titanic for hours. Once again, it was time to head back to the surface. The morning of July 18th was lovely and warm, but I felt edgy about the day's mission. We had decided to visit the Titanic's debris field, along the 1,970 feet that separated the broken off bow and stern pieces of the wreck. There was a large scattering of all kinds of objects from the ship. Everything from lumps of coal to wrought iron, deck benches had fallen. Everything from lumps of coal to wrought iron deck benches had fallen to the bottom as she broke into two and sank, but I was anxious about what we might find down there among the rubble. I, often, I had often been asked about the possibility of finding human bodies. It was a chilling thought. We had not seen any signs of human remains so far, but I knew that if we were to find any, it would most likely be during this dive. 
As the first fragments of wreckage began to appear at the bottom, I felt like we were entering a bombed out museum. Thousands upon thousands of objects littered the rolling fields of ocean bottom, many of them perfectly preserved. The guts of the Titanic lay spilled out across the ocean floor. Cups and saucers, silver serving trays, pots and pans, wine bottles, boots, chamber pots, space heaters, bathtubs, suitcases, and more. Then, without warning, I found myself looking into the ghostly eyes of a small, white, smiling face. For a split second, I thought it was a skull, and it really scared me. Then I realized I was looking at a doll's head, its hair and clothes gone. My shock turned to sadness as I began to wonder who had owned this toy. Had the girl survived in one of the lifeboats? Or had she clutched the doll tightly as she sank into the icy waters? We moved on through the amazing scenery. There were so many things scattered about it that it became difficult to keep track of them. We came across one of the ship's boilers, and there on top of it sat an upright mess rusty metal cup like the ones the crew had used. It looked as though it had been placed there by a stoker moments before water had burst into the boiling room. It was astonishing to think that, in fact, this cup had just fluttered down that night to land right on top of a boiler. Then, in the light of Alvin's headlights, we spotted a safe ahead of us. I had heard about the story of fabulous treasure, including a leather-bound book covered with jewels being locked in the ship's safes when she sank. Here was the chance of a lifetime, and I wanted to get a good look at it. The safe sat there with its door face up. The handle looked as though it was made of gold, although I knew it had to be brass. Next to it, I could see a small circular gold dial, and above, both a nice shiny gold crest. Why not try to open it? I watched as Alvin's sample gathering arm locked its metal fingers onto the handle. Its metal wrist began to rotate clockwise. To my surprise, the handle turned easily, and then it stopped. The door just wouldn't budge. It was rusted shut. I felt as if I'd been caught with my hand in the cookie jar. Oh well, I thought, it was probably empty anyway. In fact, when we later looked at the video footage we had taken, we could see that the bottom of the safe had rusted out. Any treasure would have been spread out around nearby, but there was none to be seen. Fortunately, my promise to myself not to bring back anything from the Titanic was not put to the test. Two days passed before I went down to the Titanic again. After the rest, I was raring to go at it once more. This time, we were going to explore the torn off stern section that lay 1,970 feet away from the bow. It had been very badly damaged during the plunge to the bottom. Now it lay almost unrecognizable amidst badly twisted pieces of wreckage. We planned to land Alvin on the bottom directly behind the stern section and then send JJ in under the overhanging hull. Unless the Titanic's three huge propellers had fallen off when she sank, I figured they still ought to be there, along with her enormous 101 ton rudder. We made a soft landing on the bottom and discovered that one of JJ's motors wouldn't work. Our dive looked like a washout. I sat glumly staring out my viewport at the muddy bottom. Suddenly, the mud started to move. Our pilot was slowly inching Alvin forward at its single ski right under the dangerous overhanging stern area. He was taking the sub itself to search for the huge propellers. Was he crazy? What if a piece of wreckage came crashing down? but our pilot was a professional, so I figured he must know exactly what he was doing. I could see an area ahead covered with rusticles that had fallen from the rim of the stern above. Until now, we had had ocean above us. Crossing this point was like taking a dangerous dare. Once on the other side, there was no way of escaping if disaster struck. None of us spoke. The only sound in the sub was our breathing. Slowly, a massive black surface of steel plating seemed to inch down toward us overhead. The hole seemed to be coming at us from all sides. As we looked closely, we could see we could see that, like the bow, the stern section was buried deep in the mud. Forty-five feet or so. Both the middle and the starboard propellers were under the mud. Only about sixteen feet of the massive rudder could be seen, rising out of the ooze. Let's get out of here, I said, ever so gently. Alvin retraced the path left by its ski. As we crossed over this area, covered with rusticles into the clear, we sighed with relief. We were out of the danger. All of us were glad that this adventure was over. 
Before we left at the bottom this time, however, there was one mission that I wanted to complete. I wanted to place a memorial plaque on the twisted and tangled wreckage of the stern in memory of all those lost on the Titanic. Those who had died had gathered on the stern as the ship had tilted bow first. This had been their final haven. So we rose up the wall of the steel to the top of the stern. With great care, Alvin's mechanical arm plucked the plaque from where it had been strapped outside the sub and gently released it. We watched it as it sank quietly to the deck, to the deck of the stern. As we lifted off and began our climb to the surface, our camera kept the plaque in view as long as possible. As we rose, it grew smaller and smaller until finally it was swallowed in the gloom. We made two more trips down to the Titanic. At the end of the final dive, I knew I had visited the great ship for the last time. Two and a half hours later, when we reached the surface, everybody on the Atlantis II prepared to head for home. Later that night, there would be a party on board. But through it all, I was still thinking about the Titanic, of the people who built her, sailed on her, and died when she went down.